Hi students, welcome to Business 051, Introduction to Bilingual Spanish Interpreting. This is the spring semester 2020, and I want to welcome you to the certificate program. If you're new to our program, but if you're a returning student, we're so glad to have you back. On behalf of my colleagues, Margarita de la Torre, who teaches illegal interpreting, Ayeli Strong, who teaches medical interpreting, and myself, Lillian de la Torre, we welcome you to the program. This is part one of module one, so let's get started. This is module one introduction part one. As you can see, I have the tagline here that I am bilingual proud. Just as a reminder of the asset and the talent that being bilingual and what it represents. And I'm going to be emphasizing that through every module uh, throughout the semester. The objectives for this uh, PowerPoint, we will meet and greet in class. We'll talk about why are we taking the certificate. This is your video lecture for part one. You will be quizzed, so please take notes. I'll talk about what formal and informal language means in the world of translations and interpreting. And who are we translating for? What does our Latino population look like? the different modes of interpreting, and then I'll explain what KSAs are and give you a little bit of ba uh, ba uh, background on uh, discussion, uh, do's and don'ts, and then I'll go over your class exercise one and your homework one. But first, I want to encourage you to go over your syllabus and go to module one and watch the video lecture for module one, as you need to take very good notes. And I clearly indicate to you in that video lecture, which ones, um, which parts are going to, you're going to be quizzed of. There's 20 questions. You have two attempts and that's going to be due, uh, the first week uh, of our class. So in the world of translations, we have informal language. We're going to be practicing the colloquial uh, words, also regionalism and Sam slang in our competition in our first class exercise. So colloquial. Colloquial is used in or suited to familiar and informal conversations, uh, colloquial language. So that could be dichos, the sayings, or that could be specific language that is very very unique to our place of origin. I will um, show a video in week three as to some of the colloquial words that are very popular in Mexico. And I also encourage if you're from another country, Latin America, or your parents are uh, from other countries, if you could please share some of that colloquial uh, language that you grew up with. Uh, slang, very informal word, words, again, used by a group of people. And then regionalism, a word used in a particular region. Perhaps some word in Peru is not the same as in Costa Rica and so forth. This is part of the quiz, and this is very important to know the importance of colloquial. For the bloopers, I encourage you in every class, there is extra credit for you to submit bloopers uh, for a few points. I want to encourage you that as you go about your day to be um, vigilant, if you want to say, of um, incorrect translations that are maybe in signs at public places, at hospitals, you know, at corners when people are waving signs or maybe at a mom and pop shop. Just be, um, or maybe even online if you find something that is translated incorrectly. So just share with the class and, and submit it so that I can, we, we can all take a look at what was wrong in that translation. So for the purpose of week one, I've, um, I've shared this um, this sign that was posted in London and the English reads undercover police working in this area in July three pickpockets received sentences of over four years so the back translation in Spanish is los pickpockets se guardan policía de la cubierta interior que trabaja en el área en julio 3 los pickpockets recibieron oraciones which means prayers de la prisión sobre de cuatro años so this was posted in a very busy um, intersection with a lot of tourism. And of course, it made international um, headlines as well. And in, in, in the case of in the Internet, it was posted everywhere, mocking and making fun of of the London police. Um, this is just to show you how dangerous it is to use a software program. This has serious, serious, serious translation errors, mistakes, nothing makes sense in the translations at all. 
So just want you to take a, a look at it and then maybe in your own time, see how you yourself would have translated that particular English sign to Spanish. So the most important thing to know in who is or who are we translating for? What does our Latino population look like? And the reason this is so important for our translation interpreting world is that for example, if I live in Miami, my rendition of a, of a translation has to be, uh, perhaps uh, it's going to be in a way influenced by the Cubans. Uh, the same thing if I live in New York, I cannot do a translation, even though I'm a Mexican origin, I can translate something specifically in Mexican Spanish and just take it for granted that the Puerto Ricans are going to understand it. The same as in California, if I'm a Puerto Rican and I come and do a translation or whatever for, for California, specifically LA, Orange County, San Bernardino Riverside, and I use Puerto Rican language, I need to make sure that my rendition is going to be understood by the population but the majority of the population so that's why it's so important to know who we who our target area is who our target population also it's important to know the the growth of our population and what impact that has and as I start talking about legal the legal interpreting and the demand for court interpreters in the courts it's all going to come together because there's a big demand due to the high growth of population in California. So keywords here are 58.9 million Hispanics in the U.S. That's the last census. You know, a census is coming up, but we have to go by the last census. So it's 58.9 million in the United States, million Hispanics. And for the sake of this class, I'm going to use Hispanic or um Latino interchangeably, and that's just a preference, so you could use either or. It's also important to know that our Latinos are concentrated in the majority of uh, the population live in Arizona, California, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Texas. By the way, I have a study guide and you there's no surprises to your unit quizzes. You will get your three study guides. Um, to help you prepare for your quizzes so there will be no surprises. Uh, another thing here to look at is of that 58.9 that I mentioned of the total uh, Hispanic population in the U.S., 41 million or 13.4 of the total population speak Spanish at home. So that's that just goes to show you still how prevalent it is for uh, people to continue their use of the language. But also there's a very high percentage that are bilingual with an estimated 22.5 million Spanish speakers. They also speak English very well. So that means that they are bilingual. So keep an eye on those um, very, very important um, statistics. And... Um, here is just a representation again latinos from various countries of origin they make up um they're they're live in all parts of the u.s but we do have to keep um we be very sensitive to who we are translating for example if i'm going to go to an asylum um, interview and translate for someone from colombia or someone from uh, from peru then i need to make sure that the the questions that they will be answering that i know that colloquial word so it could be uh, worth having a conversation with your client depending on their country of origin to make sure ahead of time before you do a, an interpreting or a translation job so the modes of interpreting that you're going to be um, quiz on, and also we will be um, practicing all three of this along with the written translations, the three modes of interpreting are your sight tra uh, interpreting. This is, for example, when you're looking at a form, be it a medical form, document, legal form, um, anything uh, in a form or an application and you sit down with someone and you do an oral interpretation of a written document. So you're not necessarily writing down the answers. In, in our cases, in the Latino family, we happen to be unofficial translators for our family many times because of the English limited proficiency of some of our family members. So we do write um, at times the answers um, to their applications or forms but a side translation just means that you're just telling them what the 
what is what the document says in English and you're translating from Spanish or it could be the other way around. In consecutive, the difference between consecutive and simultaneous is that in consecutive you listen first, then you register what you're going to say. You 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 practice the KSA, which I'm going to mention shortly. You translate the words and then you interpret that part of the speech to the target language. If you're listening to something in Spanish, then you're going to translate it to English or the other way around. But there's a lapse there. Versus simultaneous, you listen to the source language and interpret into target language almost at the same time. There's only a few seconds apart. So that happens very much in the like the conference, big international conferences, business conferences, uh, worldwide conferences where different speakers have different headsets for different languages and that is happening simultaneously. So we'll talk more and, and there's going to be some practice exercises for those of you that are more advanced that want to um, do this and we'll do some um, some um, also some exercises in class for those of you that want to volunteer. So basically the KSAs, uh, that's just an acronym for knowledge, skills and abilities. Also, you probably have seen it if, if you have applied for jobs in the past or currently, uh, more and more employers are narrowing down their KSAs and want you to write in your cover your KSAs, your knowledge, skills, and abilities. Especially in more advanced jobs, this is almost a given that a job description is going to list their KSAs, their knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need to have in order to be considered for that job. But how does this relate to interpreting and translating, right? So here I have a picture of the core interpreting process. And here I um, downloaded this from the Judicial Council of California. This is the entity that supervises the core interpreters program. And this is in module one is one of your assigned readings so that you could start looking at how you can develop yourself on your own and also during class your KSAs. But not just for core interpreting, or that's not your interest, because this same knowledge, skills, and abilities could be transferred to any industry that you want to work in, be it medical, interpreting translations, government, or businesses, is the same set of KSAs. So what I did, I took the liberty, you could see in the blue font, I've written those particular skills, abilities, or knowledge, how they relate and where can they be found in our modules. And some, they're throughout our semester, and then some are more specific. For example, uh, the linguistic skills right here, uh, it tells you that uh, including knowledge and use of a broad range of vocabulary, including legal terminology, because of course this is coming from the Judicial Council, it's talking about uh, preparation for being a, an effective core interpreter, but it would be the same. You just need to uh, substitute this if you want to go into the medical field and just learn medical terminology. Subject-specific terminology and slang and knowledge and use of cultural nuances, regional variations, idiomatic expressions, and colloquialism in all working languages is just what I had indicated in the previous slides, the importance of knowing this unique words to um, to the target language. So here, one example is the glossaries and the in the legal modules and uh, that we have for um, that's how you build on the vocabulary and so forth. So please uh, uh, read that uh, part of uh, your assigned readings for module one. For your discussion, um, it's going to be the same format every discussion. You have to answer the set of questions. In this case, your first discussion has a set of questions. They all have questions. By every Friday, you have to answer your questions and then you have to go back two days later or just do it. My recommendation is do not wait till Friday. And if there's already um, classmates that have already posted their answers to the questions, you need to do replies. Two replies, you need to um, submit two replies to two classmates by Sunday. So our deadlines are Sunday, but your post needs, your original question needs to be 
uh, it submitted by Friday. So let's say you go on Sunday and say, oh my God, I forgot to answer this. I'm going to answer right now and I'm going to reply to the students right now. You will be missing your um, full points for not responding on time to um, to the discussion on Friday. You'll still get partial points, but you will not get the full points. Um, also, keep in mind that I do not... Um, I have a really hard time when students, and I understand that sometimes some of you are working adults and you are perhaps posting from your phones. And um, I do see that some uh, words are not capitalized as they should. For example, I, you know, should always be capitalized, names of countries. So please be very diligent, do your due diligence and capitalize everything that needs to be capitalized for nouns and names of uh, cities or countries when you're answering your um, your discussions. Also, you need to have more than three sentences to obtain points. So let me give you an example. You're going to reply to your classmate and you thought they made such a great comment and um, you know they share with you how they learn the Spanish language and how advanced they are. Well, this is not acceptable for you to just go ahead and reply, hey, Eva, you know, this is great. Congratulations. That is not a an, um, thorough response. So uh, you need to do three sentences to obtain points. So responses like, great, good job. You know, that's not enough. You need to write complete sentences. You can reply in Spanish. You can reply in English. That's fine. But please make sure that you have at least three sentences to obtain points. And also, uh, when you answer your questions, make, make sure you number. Uh, this is the answer to number one. This is the answer to number two and so forth. So for the discussion, you do not have to submit a document. You just need to hit reply and you just need to answer your questions and then follow the thread and answer to your classmates. Also very important is for you to be familiar, familiarized with the rubric. This is the rubric for the discussion. So when you're in your discussion on the top corner, you'll see three dots. You click there and it will take you to the rubric. So the rubric pretty much is just um, explaining you how you will uh, be scored. And again, you, could, you see here that zero points is unacceptable. So if you neither... Um, answer the questions for your first post nor reply to your two classmates you'll be getting zero points and zero points so you will not pass that discussion so for the competition i'll explain more in class we will do that the second half of class the first day besides participating with your group i'm going to group doing um four to six students you're going to be in a group of four to six students i will give you a poster paper and a marker and then i will time it i will tell you when to start and you have six minutes to write colloquial words and in spanish and the nearest um translation of what you think that word means in english so, but there's some, it's not just that, doing that particular group project, but you also have to do a submission. So you need to find out, I'm going to give you some index cards and you need to find out what are the names of the classmates in your group because that's, a, that's an answer that mostly every student fails to, um, fails to answer correctly. They only answer one or two of the people's names. And so you need to make sure that you get everyone's names. And what words, if any, were new to you? Perhaps you were in a group from someone from another country other than Mexico. You never heard that that word or the other way around. You're from Central America and you never heard that word. Please share those words that were written in the poster paper that you were not familiar were, were, uh, with. And um, also, what do you think it's important when translating to be familiar with colloquial slang or regional words? From what countries were the majority of the words from your group? And also in your submission, you need to include 15 words from your group in your submission to this exercise. Now, I believe this exercise, you don't need to upload a document. You just need to hit submit and you need to write in Canvas in text and that will um, satisfy that submission. So remember, this is a written you need to write the responses, okay? So again, for the class exercises uh, throughout the semester, some will be groups, some will be individual, and some you will have to do written translations in class as part of the class exercises. So the deadlines, make sure you check the deadlines in module one and every Sunday. 
uh, mostly for all the assignments are unless otherwise noted and by this I mean I mean that maybe a speaker had to cancel last minute and I have to move maybe some assignment deadlines but I hope that our two speaking engagements that we have on Mondays that our speakers come through and are, do not cancel last minute so just remember for the discussion is different for every discussion you have to answer by Friday and then your replies to your two students, to your two classmates by Sunday. So that concludes uh, module one, part one. Uh, please proceed to watch part two as it is very important. I will review homework one in part two. Thank you.